somebody giving up their life to live for Jesus, living out the song. Introduce you to Jonathan. Jonathan joined our family here, him and his fiance Elena, just a couple weeks ago, and they've both decided to make Jesus the Lord of their life and to be baptized. So, so I want to take a few moments and I want to pray with him. I ask you to join me in that. It's a big deal, bro. This is a lifelong journey. And uh, it's not a sprint. I just want to let you know that uh, I don't know where God's going to lead the two of you geographically. Uh, but right here you have a family of people that will love you and help you. All right. Lord, I thank you for Jonathan. I thank you, Lord, that your spirit is at work in the hearts of men and women all over the world. And you're obviously at work in theirs. I thank you for saving them. I thank you for the grace that you've shown them by saving their souls. I thank you for the love that you have for Jonathan. I ask for your blessing on his family, his children. Lord, I pray that you'll help him to guide his children. Help him to guide his children into a relationship with you. Help him to love Elena like you love her, like he's been loved. Lord, I pray your great blessing on his life. I pray that his salvation would be mighty, it would be deep, that it would find the deepest parts of his heart. Lord, I pray for, for him that when the enemy comes and his flesh desires to do things that don't please you, that he'll remember this moment and he'll choose you. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Jonathan, who is your one and only Lord and Savior? Jesus. Based on that confession, I now bury you with Christ, and like him you'll be raised to new life, because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Outdone, huh? Not to be outdone. This is Elena. You all want to say hello to her, Elena? Hi. She came in with him. <laughs> Here she is. I don't know if you've uh, had a chance to meet their two little babies, too. Please do that. Uh, beautiful, beautiful little children. Beautiful little children. They're in the next room. Elena has also chosen to make Jesus the Lord of her life, and we're happy to, to be here to help you in that relationship, young lady. This is a big deal, you know. You ready for this? I'd like to encourage all believers when they're doing this uh, just to know that this isn't an automatic, everything is peachy, okay? But because it can get difficult sometimes to be a Christian, it's, it's important to, to lean on your brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's who we are, and we're here for you. So let's pray for Elena too. Father, we thank you for Elena. We thank you for what you've done in her heart, Lord. Lord, we pray that the love that you have for her will become an experience for her often, daily, moment by moment, Lord, an intimate relationship with you. Lord, I pray that your spirit would work in her heart and would begin to, to wash away all the past pains, all the past hurts, Lord, and replace it with an awareness of your love. Lord, I also pray for her that she would be a wonderful mom for her two beautiful little babies. Lord, we thank you for the gift of their children. Lord, I pray that you'll give her supernatural strength and patience to, to, to raise those children in a loving environment where they can grow up to know you and love you. Lord, I pray your greatest blessing upon her, Lord. Let her know that you love her. And Lord, I pray that, that just like Jonathan, Lord, that, that there, there would be a... a, a an awareness of what, what you've done in her heart. 
and, and you'd give her the strength, you'd, you'd, you'd strengthen her so that when, when the flesh calls out to do which wouldn't please you, which would bring harm to her and her family, Lord, she'd remember this moment right now when she gave her life to you and you'd give her the strength to say yes to you and no to sin. We ask this in Jesus' name. Elena, who's your one and only Lord and Savior? Ooh, she said it before I could even ask. I love it. Based on your confession, I now bury you with Christ. And like him, you be raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Awesome, awesome. Well, why don't we go ahead and, and grab our Bibles and open it up to Malachi 3.16. Let's, let's open it up to Malachi 3.16. And if you, if you don't have a Bible, you know, we have these orange and yellow ones everywhere. What's up, Harry? Uh, we have these orange and yellow ones here. And uh, the page number for those would be up on the screen for most of the Scripture, if not all that we're going to read tonight. And uh, so, so grab one of those, and if you don't have a Bible, just go ahead and uh, you can have one of those. Just take it home with you, you know? Take it home. So as we, as we open up our Bibles to Malachi 3.16, which is where we're going to kind of jump off tonight, I just want to back up a little bit, get us all up to speed, make sure we're all on the same page before we move forward at Malachi. What we did is two weeks ago, we started a study of the 316s. The 316s are some powerhouses. They teach us how as God's people to live and act and be the church. And even the Old Testament does. It's amazing. The 316s are incredible. We shared many of them thus far. But what we did first is we realized that, 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 that if God is going to call us into the church to, 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 to do something with him, to be on mission with him, we want to make sure that we, that we know who this God is before we commit to that work. You know, Because really, we all agreed that, uh, I think it was last week, this isn't a part-time gig, really. See, there's really no such thing as just like a full-time minister. There's really not supposed to be. We're all really full-time ministers. Did you know that? Did you know that? We're all full-time ministers. We're a holy nation of priests. We're, we're, we're the ones that God's chosen to, to go out there and do this work to advance the kingdom of God, right? And, and so before we go ahead and, and go into that full-time gig and pour all of our resources into it, we want to make sure that we're committing to something that's worthy. We want to make sure we're committing to someone who's worthy. And so we first started reading the 316s to find out who God is. We want to know if it's worthwhile investing our lives into something. Because the world is always dragging us into different things, career and, and opportunities like that. And, and we want to give ourselves to those things. But we want to, God's asking you to give yourself to him. And so we want to see if it's worthwhile. So the first thing we do is we study John 3.16. Because John 3.16 gives us an idea of who this God is, that he's a really loving God. I'm going to give you one crack at this, okay? How much does God love us? That was pretty good. That was pretty good. Well, we, we need to know that God loves us because if we don't know if God loves us, then it's really hard to invest ourselves into his mission, which is the church, the redemptive work of Christ on the cross, passed on to us, and we passed it on to other people, and we advance the kingdom this way. And so we wanted, we wanted to realize that God loves us so much that he has compassion. He, he takes this love, and it makes him act. He's, he acts in this. He sends his son. He sends his son, right? So he's know that he's loving. We know that he's compassionate. We also know that he's super generous because not only does he send his son, he saw our greatest need and he sent his greatest thing, which is his one and only son, right? That's a special gift because it's the only one of its kind, there's only one Jesus, so we see that God is so loving that he's compassionate because he sends his one and only son. We also saw that God shows his love to us by seeing us. Remember we talked about our little kids? They just say, Mommy, Daddy, look. Mommy, Daddy, look. That's their way of knowing that you love them because you're watching them. You're taking the time to look into their lives. And so that's what God does. He sees us. He hears us. You know, when people are talking to you and you just, you're, or you're talking to them and they're just staring right through you, you know, like they're not paying attention. You know they just don't care. But when someone looks you in the eye and he's paying attention to you, you know that they care, and that's who God is. He sees, he hears, he knows everything that's going on, and he acts on our behalf. He's always doing stuff for us, but we learn that it's not just based on what you do. 
He's not just wanting to bless you because you did good, because you gave, because you served, because you came to church, because you prayed for someone. Those are all good things, and we should do them. But the reason why he does things, the scripture tells us, is that he does it for his own namesake. See, he's going to protect his own reputation. He's an amazing God, and he wants everyone to realize that. So he acts on our behalf to protect his own name. So it's the pressure is off of you. So that's an amazing thing. So we know that about God. So he calls us into the church. We know that, that he is God. And so the challenge of Scripture is this. It, he, says, he says, I'm going to build my church. I want you to be part of it. And it's going to win. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to win. Hell won't prevail. I want you to do this with me. And so the challenge of Scripture, we heard it the first week, was this. If the Lord is God, follow him. Don't waver between two opinions, like a little bit over here and a little bit. Don't give him a little part-time work. Don't give him just a little bit. He wants, what does he want of us? He wants us all. Not only does he want us all, but he wants all of us. You get it? And so, I just got that one. That was really good. Okay, so, so thank you, Lord. So, 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 we, so, I don't even know where I am now. That totally threw me off. Okay, so, that's awesome. <laughs> Praise God. So, 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 so he wants us to, to go all in, right? He wants us to go all in. And he says, if I am God, if I am God, then follow me. And, and his marching orders are, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail, and I want you guys to do it. That's my chosen instrument. Can you imagine that? His chosen instrument of, redemp of redemption worldwide is you. That's crazy, right? It's you. It's me. It's you. It's every single person's room. That's what he's chosen to do. Of all the things that Almighty God who created the whole heaven and the whole earth, he could have done lots of things. He chose this plan. This is his plan. And so, so, so no longer will they have to go to the Ark of the Covenant. Remember? They don't have to go to the Ark of the Covenant where the angels are, where, where God's there and go to him there. They don't have to go to Jerusalem anymore where he's dwelling with his people. Now he, he, he's in you. The greatest concentration of God's power is inside of you. That's where his manifest presence is. Wherever you go, he goes. His church goes where Kelly is. His church goes where, where Rome is. That's where, a church, that's where his church is, where you are. We're called into that as individuals and group. Remember we learned that his spirit dwells where? In our midst. As we gather together, his power increases. He's in you, he's in me, he's in you, he's in you. And you get all this stuff together and it's like, look out, there's power there, right? There's power there. That's the church. That's the church. We learned last week that we are the water hole. That the church of Jesus Christ is the water hole for whatever community it's in. And it's really the water hole for the whole world. Wherever the church is, that's where life is because that's where God hangs out. He's hanging out with his people, right? He's hanging out in his people. And so we are the water hole. All life comes right out of here. Everyone can come to the water hole and find life. They should be able to come to the church, to the gathering of the saints, and find life and find beauty. That's what the church is. That's what the church is here locally. That's what the church is universally. He told us last week that we should get ready. That we should dig some, some ditches. Remember that? Dig some ditches. You remember talking about that? We're going to dig some ditches. Why are we going to dig some ditches? We're going to create some spaces for God to work. We want to create some places where God's spirit can come and pour life into this community. The oasis in the desert is the church of Jesus Christ. Right? And so, so what happens is it says that, the, that there will be rivers of living water flowing out of Jesus. And that, that, those, that river of living water was what? God's spirit. God's spirit was in him. And then he poured his spirit into guess who? Raise your hand. If you've got the spirit of God in you. He poured it into you, right? But don't be like the Dead Sea where it flows in and doesn't flow out. Let it flow through you into the community. And that's what the church is. That we're to reach the community by letting the Spirit of God flow into us and flow out of us into every nook and cranny of our community. And that's the church. That is the church. We also learned last week that we're to be high impact. Remember it says that his voice would thunder and it would shake the heavens and the earth. And that's what the church should be. It shouldn't be some little church. Now I'm speaking here now. Listen. It shouldn't be some little church building down a little side street where no one knows where it is and we just get together for just potlucks and have a good time together. 
That's really, that, that, that to me is not a thundering voice of God, right? A thundering voice of God is the church of Jesus Christ, is the church of Jesus Christ. And that brings us uh, to some more 316s. I want to I want to read those with you tonight, and what we want to do is we want to get a clearer picture. As we go through the 316s, we want to see what the church is supposed to be. Let God's Spirit speak to you. Go to Malachi 316, if you're not already there. Malachi 316, I love this. This is really, really spot on. It is strong. It is to the point. It is, it is mighty, but it's, but it's convicting. It's hard to swallow. This is hard to swallow for a lot of people, including myself. So, so, so here it is. You guys ready? We're going, to build, we're going to let Jesus build his church on truth. You ready? Look at here. Malachi 3.16, another powerhouse. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. Stop. Sound, kind of sounds like church to me, right? What happens when we get together? We've been hanging out now. We started at, at 6, but... Starting at about five, we just started to gather and we were just hanging out talking, right? That's what we do. The, the, the people who fear the Lord, the Christians, we just get together and we talk, right? We talk about this and we talk about that. We talk about a lot of different things, right? But look what it says here. The Lord listened to what they were saying. So he listens to everything that's going on here. We gather up together. He's listening to what we're talking about. In his presence, a, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him, which they already said. They already said it. Those who feared him, right? They gathered and they talked. So he says the scroll was pulled out not only to, to record the names who feared him, but there was also something else. Not everybody made the list. And not only feared him, but always thought about the honor of his name. That's a high call. Don't you agree? That word always kind of makes it tough. I mean, let's just be honest, right? I, I, I mean, I, I'm not always thinking about honoring God, right? I'm, sometimes I'm thinking about my sports team. Sometimes I'm thinking about grocery shopping. Sometimes I'm thinking about the kids. Sometimes I'm thinking about you. Sometimes I'm thinking about the vacuum cleaner. Sometimes I'm just, I'm just thinking about stuff, right? We're all busy. We're, so, we're, we're just busy people. But what this is saying, it like, like, I. There's one thing I don't want you to do is I don't want you to take the word of God and just brush it off like it says always. <laughs> so don't just say, well, you know, he understands. Now, I understand that he understands, but he said something. He said that the scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. These are the people, and, and look, at it says, look at it goes on to say, verse 17, they'll be my people. Those are my people. The people who are, who are thinking about me all the time, those are my people, right? Those are my people. Those are the ones I hang out with. Those are my people. Those are the ones that are going to get her done, right? Those are the ones I'm going to get it done through. Those are my people. He goes on to say that in verse 18, he says, uh, I'm going to come again. He says, and when I do, you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. See, what, what he's saying here is, is a very high call, but he's saying that, 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 that the ones who, who, who are really serving God, not just, the, not just the posers, but the ones who are really serving God are the ones who are thinking about honoring my name all the time. They're, they're pondering this Jesus. They're, they're considering this grace. They're, 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 re, they're, they're, they're responding to his salvation. They're, they're, they're planning on, on spreading the word. They're, they're coming together to praise and to give and to strategize. And how do we bring honor to your name, Lord? Can I, can I not say this because I want to say that? Can I, can I do this even though I, I really don't think you want me to? What should I do? Like constantly thinking like, Lord, how can I bring honor to your name? Like that is the, the focus of my day. Like when I wake up, I, I, I thinking about how can I bring honor to your name? How can I bring glory? How can, how can you be more famous in my world? How can people love you more because of my life? What is there in my life that's keeping people from you? Or, or maybe there's something I need to add to my life to help bring more people to you. Is there something in my life? Search my heart, Lord. Is there something in me that's not right? Like, and they're always thinking this. Like, I wake up thinking about this. I'm at work, I'm thinking about this. When I go to bed, I'm thinking about this. This is who we're called to be. 
The scriptures say to, to, to fix our eyes on Christ. The scriptures also say to set our, our thoughts on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. The scriptures tell us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Like the, this is a priority statement. He's saying, my people, my church, I don't care what people have done to it, what it's morphed into, their people's opinion about it. My real church are people that are constantly thinking about honoring my name. That's who we are. That's who we're supposed to be. It's a priority statement. What it's asking you here, actually what it's commanding of you is to not compartmentalize your life. Don't be Moses at church versus Moses at home. Don't be Harry at church versus Harry at the gym. Don't be Joe at the church versus Joe at Walmart. Don't be Jessica here versus Jessica there. Don't be Wendy here versus Wendy there. You should be the same person. You know who you should be? The person who's constantly thinking, how can I honor the name of God? That's what I should be doing all the time. It's a constant, constant, repetitive, nonstop thing. That's who we are. It's a priority in our life. We're called higher than just a Sunday guy or, 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 or a Saturday night guy where, where we put on our church face or anything. You know, we're, that's, he wants us to be those people all the time, but yet, remember I said, and it's so true, we're so distracted, right? There's so many things to do. There's so many things that are kicking and screaming and, 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 and trying to grab your attention and your focus, and so it's hard to kind of always be thinking of ways to honor God, right? Because you gotta make your car payment, you gotta change the oil, and the, and the grass needs to be cut, and your kids are calling, you need to be picked up, and your neighbor just ticked you off, and you wanna go cuss them out, and, and this has to be done, and the dinner has to be cooked, and, and the ball game starts at six, and, and my wife wants to go here, and, my, and it's just nonstop, right? And, but what's God calling us? He's like, you wanna be my people? My church are the ones who are always thinking of ways to honor me. That's what my people are. That's what they are. And it is a high call. It is a high call for sure. The Revolution Church, since God placed you here, he's carefully placed the church together according to his good pleasure. So being part of the church, for you it's being part of Revolution Church, and it's called to be a people with this in mind to prioritize our lives. To always be thinking of ways to honor God in all that we do. By making his purpose and his mission and his word the constant desire of our heart. See, it's hard to say that, that I'm a Christian and I love Jesus, but I won't even pick up my Bible because I just don't like to read. I'm calling people out, right? I mean, I hear it. I'm just not a reader. Fiddlesticks. Get you, get you version. It's, it reads it to you. <laughs> I mean, you can't be more lazy than that, right? That's awesome. You can press a button and it'll read it to you, right? And, then you, and some of them have like James Earl Jones and I mean, it's like Charlton Heston. It's like God talking to you. You can't ask for anything better than that. But that's what, the, that's what this scripture is telling us. And see, again, the disconnect comes when we allow, when God's people allow, and it's a choice, to let distractions set in. If you allow these things to set in, at some point, the man or the woman of God puts a line in the sand and says, enough, devil, and no further. I'm committing myself to the purposes of God, to the mission of God, to the love and worship of God, and I'm not letting this thing in my way. That's it. That's what we do. That's what, you can clap. It's okay. You can clap for Jesus. It's cool. So. I heard this, I wanna, I'm gonna just blatantly steal it from my preacher friend who said this. I heard him say this, but I, you, gotta, you gotta recognize, listen to the nuance of the words. Like it's not, don't just, don't let me just read it. Listen to what it says because it really speaks to the, to the reprioritizing of our lives. See, most of us have our own personal lives. We get up in the morning, we do some things, and then um, during the course of that day, we'll say some prayers. We got like dinner prayer and breakfast prayer and bedtime prayer. And some of us pray before we get up and some of us pray before we go to bed. And some of us will go to a Bible study and some of us will, will listen to a preacher and some of us will come to church. And some of you wild, crazy freaks come here and then go somewhere else on Sunday like, whoa, like crazy, right? Now I understand that. But here's the thing. That's wrong. It's good. 
but it's not great. Listen to what this preacher said. He was praying. I heard him pray it. And he said, Lord, let what we do in kingdom work bleed into our personal lives. You getting that? Did you see the switcheroo? See, most of us, let we have our personal life, and then we give some of it up to God in increasing measure. And that's good. But what he's saying here is, Lord, let us have a complete mind shift. Let what we do for the kingdom bleed into our personal life. That the kingdom work is the priority of your life. That's what you see. The scriptures tell us that you were created by him and then what? For him. him. The reason you draw another breath is to bring honor and glory to the name of God. That's it. That's the reason. Now, it's exercised in different things, different career fields, different occupations, different community groups, all these different things. It's fleshed out in those things, but the reason you live, here's the purpose of your life. This is 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 awesome. This is free. It's to bring glory to God. That's the reason why we live. That's the reason why we gather. That's the reason why someone sweeps this floor. That's the reason why someone changes the toilet paper. That's why somebody preaches. That's why somebody paints. That's why somebody sings. That's why somebody digs a ditch. Whatever it is, for the glory of God. Every single thing that we do should be an attempt to bring honor to the name of Christ. That's our life. That's what we're for. Now, I understand this is a really really high call to say God's people are the ones who are always thinking about honoring his name. That's a tough one, right? Because we're distracted. But God gives us help. God gives us help. Let's bring us to the next one. Check out Ephesians 3.16. Go there with me. God doesn't leave you hanging. He doesn't say go out there and just fight this fight yourself. Not at all. He's, He's here for you. He's here for you. Look at it says here. Holler when you get there. Hola. I like that. <laughs> All right, you ready? Now here, here's, here's Paul, right? Paul wrote this, and he's, he's been inspired by the Spirit of God to write this because he, God wants us to hear this. He wants us to, to, to do this. He wants us to see the result of this. He, know, he wants us to do this thing. Look what Paul says here. Paul says, I'm going to pray. So he says, I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources. Now, first of all, Donald Trump don't have glorious, unlimited resources, does he? He's got a lot of resources, but they're not glorious and they're not unlimited. And, and Bill Gates has, has a lot of resources, even more than the Don. But, he, but he, they're not glorious and, and they're not unlimited, right? I mean, there's only one who has glorious unlimited, endless resources. And Paul says, I pray that from God's glorious unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Okay? So, so this is what he wants. This is, this is the church. The church is a group of people that pray. You see, and I think that we need to make sure we do that. I think that, I think that's an area that our church here at Revolution, we could do better at. We need to be a praying church. See, because if God calls us into the mission to, to, to redeem the community and to, and release the power of God into the community, that, then we need that spirit in us to strengthen us to be able to go do that all the time. Because he says, do it all the time always thinking of ways to honor my name. So how can I do that, Lord? Because I'm distracted. I'm overwhelmed. I don't have the the ability. I don't feel the courage. Well, he says pray. He says pray and ask me from my glorious unlimited resources to strengthen you, to give you that Holy Spirit, to give you the boldness to say no to sin, to say yes to righteousness, to say no to the flesh, and to say yes to God, and to say no to fear, and say yes to courage, and go out and proclaim the gospel aggressively. He said, we need to be a praying people. See, that's what the church of Jesus Christ is. It's a group of people that are absolutely relying on the power of God to get the job done. It says in the scripture, is that he is the one who gives us the, the, the desire and the, and, the, and the, what is the word? And the, the desire, I just, it just came to me, so I'm just I'm trying to be obedient here. Uh, the desire and the will to do, to do that which pleases him. It's, it's the work of his spirit that, that helps us to do that. We can't do it on our own. If left to our own devices, we would never just think constantly of doing things just for God. It's just not who we are. 
So the Church of Jesus Christ is a, is a group of people that get together and they make prayer a, a, a steady staple of their diet as they gather together. That's who he is. But it also, I, I, when I read this, I know that that's what he wants to do. And see, that's why he encouraged Paul to pray, and that's why he's encouraging you to pray for the Spirit of God to work in you because he wants to empower you, because he wants to use us so he can advance his kingdom through this church that we would release the, 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 the living waters from us into this community, that all the people around here could come here and, and they, could, they could drink deeply from the oasis of, of Jesus' Spirit right through this church. Now, Here's the next one. That was quick through uh, Ephesians, but I want to uh, I want to take your attention to Philippians three sixteen. All right, three sixteen. But but as you go there, I want to just I want to share something with you. This is going to be a verse. It, it's I, I took you away from Ephesians. I probably shouldn't have, but but Ephesians three twenty says this. Now based on the fact that Jesus says I'm going to build my church and I'm going to use you to do it, the church can never get prideful if it succeeds. If you, if you move into, into a facility or, or whatever and there's tons of people come to the Lord and people are getting baptized like crazy and, and we're sending out dollars and people onto the mission field in the millions and, and hundreds of people and all these quote unquote successes in the church, a lot of the churches can get prideful. And, and so this here, this Ephesians 3.20, before you go to Philippians, Ephesians 3.20 just keeps us in check. And this is the verse that we're going to come back to a lot here in the, in the next couple of weeks moving forward. But, but this says, it starts out here, now all glory to God. See, now all glory to God. See, when he builds this church, it's all glory to God. It's not glory to me. It's not glory to revolution. It's not glory to first this or second Baptist that. It's all glory to God. If the, ch if the, if the church advances in the kingdom and it grows and, and people come to Christ, it's not glory to us, is it? Say, no, it's not. No, it's God. All glory to God, all glory to God, by his mighty power. So we can read this. Now all glory to God, tell me if you agree with this. Now all glory to God, by his mighty power at work, he can do infinitely more than we could ever ask or think. Who agrees with that? I agree. But here there's a sec section that I left out on purpose. And this is where it gets kind of tough for us to understand. Because we're a church of you know, a small group, 30, 40, sometimes we've hit 100 people at most. And it's hard to get this, but I want you to, if you don't get anything else, get this tonight. I left out a section of the verse on purpose, because you've got to get it. Now all glory to God by his mighty power at work within us, within you, within you, within us. He can do infinitely more than we could ever ask or think. See, he can, he, we, we, you have to start thinking about this. You gotta start, I, I, I don't wanna be alone in thinking that, that, that we as a group of people, loved saints of God, empowered by a spirit, could, could do infinite, that God could do infinitely more through us than we could ever even ask or think. Like we couldn't, we, we shouldn't just think that, oh Lord, would you just fill this building would you just let us support uh, uh, 10 kids from Compassion? Could, could, you, could you let us have another campus over in Apopka maybe? Don't think that way. You can't think that way. Now all glory to God. By his mighty power at work within us, he can do infinitely more than we could ever ask or think. No matter what grand thing you think it could be, he could do way more than that through us, his people. You are that precious and important. Do you understand this? Saints, that should bring a smile to your face. <laughs> he loves you and he's chosen you to reach a, a, a desert out there. You're the oasis in Eustace. You're the oasis in Lake County. You're the oasis. And he wants to use you to breathe life into this city and beyond and beyond. Look at Philippians 3.16. Just going through the 3.16s is all. Are you there? Okay. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Kind of brief, right? But there's some stuff there. There's some stuff there and it piggybacks what I was talking to you about. You see, you can't Hold on to progress if you never made any. 
right? You gotta make progress to hold on to progress. But my point here is that, two things, we've made tremendous progress. Do you realize in this little room right now with just you, some of you know this, but Jonathan and Elena are almost the 200th person that have been baptized at this church. That's insane. That's insane. Yeah. Thank you, my Pentecostal brother. Thank you, thank you. That's great. We've made some progress. We, we, we've made, I, you know, I'm not alone in seeing people in this church that their lives have changed. Amen? Their lives have changed. God's spirit is at work in you. We've made progress, Joe, haven't we? How many days, I'm gonna say, how many days you've been sober, brother? How many? Today is the ninth? 39 days, bro. You know what happened? Let me just tell you something. I, can, I, can I be honest? He don't care, right? He was homeless walking down this street. And I walked outside and happened to, happened to, stumble upon him. And we started talking. And he's been sober since that day. He comes to the church, hooked him up with Pete. He's at the house. He's coming. He's studying the scripture. He's getting ready to be baptized. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lives are changing. We've made progress. But the point of this is, is also is that progress is good. And see, we have to always be thinking about that. Progress is good. We want to make progress. We want to hold on to it. We want to make progress. See, the whole, the whole church thing is based on progress. See, Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, which means what? That it's going it's to get, it's a congregation, right? It's a, an assembly of people. It's going to grow in size. It's going to grow in depth as lives are changed for those that are already here. They're going to grow in their relationship with the Lord. Their roots are going to grow down deep, and he's going to pour life into them, and they're going to have have a greater faith, they're going to have a greater trust, they're going to serve in a greater way, they're going to love in a, in a new way, they're going to love the Lord, they're going to love people more, you're going to see it, and that's what Jesus is going to do, so you can see he's going to build it, it's going to, there's going to be what? Progress, right? And, 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 and so you see, not only that, but like um, Jesus in, in Acts uh, 1.8 after he's you know, gone to the cross and died and, and he raises again, he, it says that he hung out, he, he showed up on occasion and hung out with his apostles and taught them about the kingdom. And one of the things he said was this, that you, he looks at his small group of guys, he says, you will be my witnesses. So here we are building the church again. This is what Jesus came to do. He came to build a church, to, to grow a congregation, to have everyone love him and everyone worship him, because what? He deserves it, right? <coughs> so he says, listen, Guys, um, you're going to be my witnesses. I've chosen you to go do something. You're going to be my witnesses here in Jerusalem. That's where they were hanging out. That's, let's just call it hometown, right? You're going to be my witnesses, so you're going to do a work here. People are going to know me. You're going to be an oasis in this dry and barren land right here in Jerusalem so they can know me. Then you're also going to be a witness, not just here at home, catch a vision here, folks, not just here at home, but in Judea. See, Judea was the area that Jerusalem was in. So for our sake, let's just call this like we're Eustace, but we're in what? We're in the Golden Triangle. We're in Lake County, right? We're in Florida. See, you can see how it keeps expanding outward. So he says this to these people, this group of people. He says, listen, I know you're here, and you're going to be my witness. You're going to be my oasis in this dry land here in Jerusalem, also in Judea, which is the area that Jerusalem is in, also in Samaria, which was the next level out. Here's Jerusalem, here's Judea, and then here's uh, uh, Samaria here. And then when? And then where? To the ends of the earth, which is what? To the ends of the earth. It's a kind of easy one, right? I want you to be a witness. I want you to be my church here, 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 and here. And I want you to catch a vision now, guys. Listen, this is the, not, no one limited you to just this city. 
No one, just be, it says it in the scriptures, and we, we believe the scriptures for all parts of life, but believe the scriptures here as a part of your life. He, Jesus said that you will be a witness to Eustace, to the Golden Triangle, to Florida, to the United States, and to the ends of the earth, and so we should be thinking about that, planning and praising and strategizing. We want to send people out to the ends of the earth. We want to send people out to North Florida. We want to send people out to South Florida. We want to send people out to the West Coast. We want to send people overseas to other countries. We want to send people all over the place. That's my heart, that our church would be a biblical church like Jesus said we would be. That's what I want for this revolution church. I want to be that people. I want to be that people. So, but, but, but it starts here though, doesn't it? Starts right here in Eustace. This is where God stuck us, right here in Eustace. And Dan loves it. Yes. <laughs> but he stuck us here. Right? He stuck us here. But let me ask you a question. How many people have a job they don't like? Just be honest. But you go there, right? But when you're there, yeah, especially Mikey. But, but, but when you're at that job, even if you don't really love it, but you can, what can you do while you're there? You can work as unto the Lord, right? And so if we're here in Eustace, I commend him. And I think I commend you because I think you feel the same way. That wouldn't be their first choice to be in Eustace, but while they're here, we're going to bless this city with all that we have. That's what we're going to do. We're going to work as unto the Lord, and we welcome you into that. It starts with us. We're to be the oasis in this city. We're to dig ditches, to create spaces where God can work so he can pour his spirit out of Jesus into us and through us into every facet of our society here in town. You know, the Bible has a picture of this for you. I welcome you to, to ch take a look at this word picture. It's in Genesis 39. I want you to go to Genesis 39, 1 through 5. You'll see a great story. Um, Joseph, one of the most famous guys in the Bible. His life is just, I mean, just, I, 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 I don't even know how to say it. It was a roller coaster. It's just a roller coaster? That's a good word for him, roller. It was so good. It was so bad, you know. Just, he had power. He was also thrown in a ditch. He was a slave. I mean, just, it was crazy, right? So, so but I want to invite you to, to, to look at this here, this, this part of his story, right there at the beginning of the Bible. You'll see it. Um, this is a picture of the church. This is a picture of us. This is who we're to be. I want to read this to you. It says here, um, I mean, trying to figure out, what, you know, what are we supposed to do here in Eustace? What should we be? Who should we be? Who should we be, this, this family? Well, this is who we should be. When Joseph was taken to Egypt, right there in verse 1, when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. So let me just ask you this. Do, do you think he's happy about being there? Anyone want to answer that one? He's not happy about being there. He's, he's sold as a slave, okay? So he's not happy about being there. But, 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 listen. Okay, so he's purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph. Uh, I, I just want to re remind you of something. A few moments ago, I asked you where, where God lives, and you all raised your hands. He's with you, right? God's with you. Whether you're in Eustace, Tavares, Mount Dora, Ocala, Altamont, Uganda, Nepal, it, Afghanistan, Iraq, doesn't matter where, where you are, right? Who's with you? God's with you. God's with you. The Lord was with Joseph, too. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Boy, that's a work ethic. That, that would preach, man, right there. No matter where you are, you can shine for the Lord because his spirit is with you. Okay, so Potiphar noticed this. So people will notice when, God, when God's shining through you, people are going to stand up and take notice of that, aren't they? It says it right there. See it? Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. You see the favor of God, but it's for his own namesake. Oh, it's amazing. He, he put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household, listen, for Joseph's sake, for Joseph's sake, all his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. 
So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Amen. See, see here's the picture. And, and, and God is with us. Amen? God is with you. He's with the folks here at Revolution Church. And, and because he's with you, favor is upon you. And wherever you go, you see that the, that, the, that the crops flourish. Everything was good. It was successful. Where there's life, where God is, there's life and beauty. And it's good. And so what he's saying here is that because Potiphar, Potiphar wasn't a godly man, was he? He's not a godly man. He didn't deserve the blessing. Why was his household blessed? Because Joseph was there. And why will Eustace be blessed? Come on, because revolution is here. See, I want you to be thinking about that of yourselves. This city will be blessed because you are here. See, I, I, years and years and years have gone by, and I don't see that the city is truly blessed because, because of the presence of, of Almighty God here in his church. I don't see a whole lot of influence. I see some, but not nearly enough. Not what it could be. Not that the whole thing would be a success and blessed because the church was there. And I believe that God's brought us here for that reason. I really, truly do. That that's why God brought us here, to bless the city, and that this city would be completely different because we are here. How will he get this accomplished? How will, this, how will God work through this church to get it accomplished? Well, you just need to look at our, our, our identification statement, our missions, whatever you want to call it. We're a gospel-centered, culture-creating community. Listen, everything we do is in response to the gospel, that the gospel is the power to save. The gospel is the most beautiful thing that there ever was. Undeserving people des getting the love and forgiveness of Christ. And because we've received this love, we can pour out that love on other people that they will not get anywhere else. We are a gospel-centered, culture-creating community. We're, we're a group of people that love each other and we tick each other up, but we still love each other. And the other people out there, they're not used to that kind of love. So we're a gospel-centered community that brings beauty to the world. That brings beauty to the world. We're an oasis in the middle of the desert. That's who we are. That's who you are. You're beautiful people gifted with talents and abilities, and all these spiritual gifts and talents and this smile and a handshake and a helping hand and, and a forgiveness and a love that people aren't used to. And if we would pour that out on people, the rivers of living water pour out of you into these people, it will make our city blessed just because we are here. That's how it will happen. That's how it will happen. But we have to make sure that this mission is on our lips all the time. It's on our thoughts all the time. It's in our words all the time. Remember, he said, you know who my people are? They're the ones who are always thinking on how to honor my name. That's, we can't get distracted. That's who we have to be. We have to bring who we are and what we have to the city that we're in. That's what we're supposed to do. And we're not to beg them to come and hang out with us. Think of how foolish that is. Young man, I forget your name and I have to apologize, but what's your name? Mason. Everyone wanna say hello to Mason? Mason? You love Mason. Do you know that? Excellent. What if Mason's birthday was tomorrow? You wanna to buy him a gift, right? So what if they threw a party for him? That'd be good, right? So what if we just all called up Mason and his parents and said, hey, listen, I got a gift for you, Mason, but you're gonna have to get in your car and come to my house to get it. Oh, and by the way, same thing with Kelly. He got you something, isn't that nice? He's so nice, but he's not gonna bring it to you. You gotta go to his house to go get it. And Mary, it was so nice of you. You bought him a gift too. You're so sweet. But you know what, Mason? We're not coming to your party. You're gonna have to come to where we are to get your present. Now, that seems kind of foolish, doesn't it? What would we do? What would we do? We would bring our gift to the birthday boy, wouldn't we? Wouldn't you bring your gift to the birthday boy? And so that's the way it's supposed to be with the church. We're to bring our gift to the birthday boy. And biblically, that's the precedent. You know, Jesus and Paul, that's what they did. They, they, they had a gift. And they went to where people were. They didn't just hide away in a corner somewhere and hope that people were gonna show up. They went to where people were 
and shared the good news of the kingdom with them. And most often they went to places that were, that were, that were uh, like very busy so that when they received the good news, then they could go and give the good news as well. You see? That's the way Jesus and Paul did it. And that's the way we're supposed to do it. God is moving here. God is moving here. He's brought some wonderful new families into our church. We've seen some lives changed. We see people getting saved. We see people getting baptized. He is working here in our church. And he's opened up recently a huge door of opportunity to advance the kingdom of God through you. Through you. You are his chosen vessels of redemption. You are his chosen vessels of reconciliation across the city and beyond. And I'm proud to be a part of such a, 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 a church. I'm proud to be, to be part of such a church that desires to partner with Jesus, to, to advance the kingdom to this community and beyond. I need you to catch a vision here, folks, of what God can do through you. I want you to catch a vision of what he can do through you. Not only am I proud to be a part of a team that wants to, to, to partner with Jesus to bring the gospel to the, to the ends of the earth, but I'm also proud to be, a team, to, be, to be part of a team that is concerned with you and wants to create a, 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 an opportunity to, to serve Christ and serve this community through a variety of meaningful ways. Remember, this is the verse, all glory to God by his mighty power at work in us. He can do infinitely more than we could ever ask or think. He is going to build his church. Can someone say amen? amen? All right. Now listen, last week I told you that we need to dig some ditches, right? You all remember that? We need to dig some ditches. We need to create some spaces where God can fill, where God can work, where God can pour his spirit into people, into a community. And, 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 and remember the story. Remember the story of Elijah with the, with the jars and the little thing of oil. Can you see it? Remember? And, and, and he, said, he said to the widow and to the kids, go get the jars and don't get but a few because I'm ready to rock your world. I'm going to fill these jars with life. You won't believe the provision so get a bunch of jars. So they went and got a bunch of jars and they started filling them up. This little thing was filling up jars of oil. And the oil ran out when the jars ran out. But we all agreed that if we kept bringing jars, right? You keep bringing jars, God would have filled the jars with oil. He wouldn't have stopped. He was ready to rock the, the world, right? And we stopped him. So we've been given an opportunity to bring jars. We've been given an opportunity to not dig ditches, but to, to dig a, 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 a trench that, that, will, that will, 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 will go right down the, the, the heart of the city and where he can pour his spirit out into us and we can pour his spirit out into people and, and change this city so that this city is, is no longer like the, the worst city of the three. You know, like our, 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 our city here is, is, is in the Golden Triangle, right? But Mount Dora has, the, has a reputation of, 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 of like the artsy, fartsy, wealthy town, right? And, and, and Tiberius has the, they have all the city, the, the county offices, it's the county seat, so they have all the big buildings and the courthouse and all that stuff. And what about Eustis? Hey, Eustis has a, has a pretty poor reputation. There's a lot of struggling and hurting people here, right? It doesn't have any, anything really to be proud of. But it does. You know what it has? People. It has people made in God's image to be like him. Value, worth, worshipers. It's got people. And so I believe that we've been sent here to change the reputation of our city. To give it a new hope. To give it something new. To give it something new. So, so, so here's, the, here's the trench. Here's the trench. You ready? 213 North Grove Street. Anyone know where that is? Oh, that gives it away, doesn't it? The pink elephant. The pink elephant. You remember the pink elephant? 
Yes. Finally, someone decisive. Yes, I know where that is. <laughs> God's opened up a door of opportunity for us. Years ago, thank you, Gracie. Years ago, I shared this a couple weeks ago, but years ago, I was inspired to write something. And one of the things that came out of this Your Kingdom Come paper, two and a half page thing, was that the church would not be hiding down little side streets where no one knew it was there and was just to gonna come together and pray and preach and sing and go home. That's where we are. Oh, Gracie, baby. She just totally face planted. You're so cute. God's given us an opportunity to have a higher impact that God's voice might thunder through this city. And, and, and so we've been given the opportunity to have our church gathering there instead of here. This place here is an opportunity for us to make a statement of who we are. That we're a people that care about the city that we live in. And that we're going to go to a place that is where they are not begging them to come where we are, but to be out there where there's people, the, re the, the traffic all day, the restaurants, the financial institutions, the doctor's offices, the coffee house, the playhouse, all these different things are all right there. George Fest, they have First Friday, they have the Carnival, they have July 4th. There's thousands and thousands of people that go by there every single day. And it's an opportunity for us to be able to have a higher impact with what we've been given. This place here is in the center of our heart, of our city. Not only does it, well, I'll give you some practical stuff in a moment. But, 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 but not only is it, a, is, is where is it located, that's awesome, but directly across the street, if you're standing on the front step, in front of you is the entire downtown Eustis, the waterfront, the post office, where Waterman was is all a, a city park now for, for us to use for free. And we have a huge parking lot that we could use that we don't have a parking lot here. And it's right there where just nonstop all day. You know the beautiful thing about all of this? It's one word, people. That's it. We're here to impact people, to change people's lives. That's why we're here. And so it's an opportunity to reach more people with the good news of Jesus, that they would know that we're here, that when they have their great needs, when they're, when they're struggling and hurting and scared and, and they have needs, that they would know where to go. Top of mind, top of mind, top of mind. I drove by there every day, I see it, that's where they are. I've been inviting people to this church since we moved in and nobody knows where it is. We've got a flag out there that's flying that nobody sees. <laughs> it's a nice flag. We want people to see it. We want people, don't you want to know, don't you want your city to know where you are? Don't you want to be able to reach out to them in, in a greater way? So it's a thousand square feet more. It's right on the major highway. It has a grass field across the street that we can play frisbee and football and picnics and concerts and all that stuff. High visibility, right where people are. Huge parking lot that we don't have and it's the same price as this. Praise God. Praise God. So we have the opportunity to move there. We have the opportunity to move there. Others in your family would like to share. We haven't involved everyone. You all got stuff going on. There's people in your church that you know and love and trust as spiritual leaders here, and we've been involved. Seeking the Lord, praying, looking, planning, all that kind of stuff. I'm not the only one, and there's some that would like to share what their heart is, what their vision is, what they see there, what the value is. I just know that... Um, I don't know if, can somebody, John, can you, can you, up there, can you go get Meredith, please? You know, my, my, my beautiful wife, she, she's up there with the kids now. She, she this is funny. Um, how many people in here were over at our old building in Leesburg? Raise your hand. 
How many people liked it? Yeah, okay. How many people like this building more than the old building? 50-50. I loved that old little building. I loved that little place. I don't love this place. My wife loves this place. She's an old church lady, though, you know? She's coming. And, and, and here's the thing. I love that old place. She loathed. She might not have told you, but she loathed that old building. Can I, we're a family, right? I know everybody here. I loathe this building. <laughs> I do. And I love that old building. But for the first time, we went in there and we saw this place. And both of us, our hearts just fluttered, man. We both just love it. And, and she wants to share with you why she loves it. And if, if you don't mind, but in the meantime, oh, here she comes. Come on, old church lady. See? I've been working out. <laughs> I've been working out. It's all right. They can, they can hang out. Hello. Hey, there we go. Come on, kids. So she, she just wants to kind of share with you what she sees when she walked into that building and what she'd like to do. Hey, don't jump in there, guys. Tonight, Not we yet. only have like a small portion of the children that are usually here in this church building. And I am so excited because not only are they going to have their own rooms, but they have a whole entire suite. They have multiple rooms, multiple area, and I can't wait to get in there. I am so excited. No more stairs for your personal safety of the children because as we actually walked down these stairs just now, one of them got hurt. So for the safety of your children, this building <laughs> is so exciting. I can hear myself. I can hear myself. Oh. Okay. So the the building is going to be safer for your children. They will have their own suite. They will have their own rooms. They will be separate from each other. They will be separate from you. I don't know if you heard my child screaming all night tonight. You won't hear that in the new building. It will be quiet for you all, and it will be quiet for them. And I cannot wait to be in there and for them to be in a safe environment that they can enjoy and they can be rowdy too because they <laughs> like to have fun and it's hard because we want to be you know courteous to you all down here so they can't exactly have the fun that we would and they would love to have but in this new joint place <laughs> building don't press those buttons um, whatever you do <laughs> they they will have the opportunity <laughs> to be able to play and to do the things that they would like to do. Awesome. Thank um, you. Anything else? Well, I mean, I could go on and on about how excited I am. I am so thrilled. <laughs> and I haven't spoken to anybody yet, but um, I'm really excited because we kind of have a little bit of an idea. It's called Revolution Kids Suite. Rev up your faith. Rev up I hope your, your wheels <laughs> are turning. Rev up. <laughs> Anyways, so I'm excited. Thank you, dear. I think you guys know him, huh? I know a couple of you. Hello, hello. <laughs> Howdy. It's kind of a bombshell, maybe. It is awesome. It is awesome, because why? I, I started thinking about, what am I going to tell these guys about this? I mean, you're just learning about, whoa, we're going to be moving. That can be kind of scary, you know? But it's exciting at the same time. Because it's kind of like, I was watching Jocelyn paint this. What did this start out looking like? It was just white, wasn't it? This place, this place, this building, is like a blank canvas. 
So guess what? The, the thing about the old place over in Leesburg that everybody seemed to, what, if you liked it, one of the reasons you liked it was because it was yours. Because you got to make it yours. Because when you invested in it, it was a piece of you. And I remember the day when we had to leave there, and we were all sad because so many people had put so much of their heart and soul into this place, and we had to shut the doors and leave. Now God has given us another opportunity. This building has been awesome. It has been incredible. I think there's been amazing blessings and growth here. But one thing that hasn't really been able to happen was for Revolution's church's identity to be expressed. And it's expressed through every one of us. Amen. It's expressed through the kids. Meredith just said it, exciting. Our kids will have their own rooms. There won't be stairs. When I think of stairs, I think of all the people that have to come in here from up the ramp. What will it be like for Philip, who could, who could then go anywhere he wants in the place with extra room, because there's another, what, thousand square feet? Over a thousand. Yep. So another thousand square feet for him to motor around. And what about anybody else that might, be, might come to the church that's handicapped, that maybe doesn't get around so well? This, is, this place is a little rough. <laughs> but we want to be inviting. We need, they, they will give a way for people to be able to have access to the church, to, to, to love, to family, to hope, to, to be expressive of who they are, the way this artwork happens every week. Mary, there's no kitchen yet. But, but what if you had the chance to have a say about how that kitchen came together? It could, it could happen. It's, it's a chance to express that once again. How do we feed people? Mary's got a heart for that. Well, we have the chance to design how that will look. How will that function? How, how can that all happen? We all get to, to be able to create, to be God's people there in the building. To once again express our identity, which was given by Christ, in us. There's a passage that Moses said tonight that really hit me. It was out of uh, Philippians 3.16. And, and do you remember what it was? Yeah, hold on to the progress we've made. Hold on to the progress we've made. I looked it up in the NIV as I was sitting there. I, I like to flip between translations. The NIV, that same verse says, live out what you've already attained. Amen. Same verse, a little bit different spin to it. So what's Paul saying? We've already attained what? Freedom in Christ, an identity of who we are in Jesus Christ. And he says, live that out. That's awesome. And this, is, I think, is an opportunity for each one of us for the players to play, for the singers to sing, for the artists to be artists, for the, for the cookers to cook and bake, for the, for the kids to be kids, for, for every one of us to, to be there, right in Eustace. On, on first Fridays, I'm thinking, we're having a band, we're cooking out in the parking lot, somebody comes over, we get to feed them and introduce ourselves and say, hey, and just love on people. Amen. Like revolution. <laughs> Love being right in the center of it. We get to do that. That's an opportunity. That's a, that's a way to show God's love just because we're, we're there. How great would that be? Amazing. Amazing. So, as it may be a little scary, it is a little exciting, and I think there's hope there. There's never hope if you just sit still. Hope comes from taking a chance 
and putting it on the line. And you know what? I wouldn't want to do that with anybody else other than these guys, you, all you guys right here. Amen. I got hope because I see it in every face. And I know other people in Eustace are going to see your faces and it's going to give them hope. Amen. Amen. That's all I got. Thank you. Can I hug you? Love you. Love you back. Dan? Hello. <laughs> uh, most of my feelings have actually already been said. So I'm the last person to say anything, I believe. Um, but one of the things, well, first I walked into that building and I felt at home right away because there was a lot of stuff that needed to be done. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things, though, that w when, I, when my wife and I and my family came to SNL was then, one of the things that actually got us there was that they needed so much and so much help and so much everything they needed that that's what brought us there was we weren't visitors, we weren't members, we don't have that here, but we just weren't a part of the church and we came to help with something and never left because obviously we still need a lot of help. <laughs> so, but one of the things that really kept us there in that help me grow and I believe the rest of my family is um, all the relationships that were formed by the stuff that was done there I mean we put this is people that aren't roofers that aren't painters that just have a, some skills here and there but I mean we put a twenty thousand dollar roof on that building and that was hours and hours and hours of mm. of work that we gave away Ooh. shortly after that but I made some great friends then I mean friends that I had from the church, but after spending hours and hours and weekends and hours on the roof with them, I became better friends with them. So this place needs a lot of stuff. It's mostly cosmetic, so like, you know, we don't need to redo the foundation or anything, but it's, you know, a lot of painting and all that stuff and arranging it, getting it set up, and that's going to require everybody who has any time or skills or anything. You mean the ones to, who are always thinking about honoring his name? There you go. Amen. Those, yeah. those ones. So, so I look forward to those relationships that are yet to come. Um, that sounds awesome. Plus, uh, oh, there's tons of parking. There's all kinds of stuff to do there. I can drive a go-kart inside, I think. Can I, I think awesome. I can. Yes, I think okay. you should. See, I'm in. So awesome. anyway, that's, that's about all I have. Thank you. Thank you. What's that? Where is it? Okay. When you when you yeah, when you take a right out of here and go down to nineteen, you know it's only one way. So you take that right and you go two blocks, it's Clifford. As soon as you get to Clifford, you go like that. It's right there. And right across the street is the post office and the field where the hospital used to be. That's the building. It just it's it sits right there. I um I took a, 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 a an evening to to prayer walk Eustace um, to just really seek the Lord in this and try to decide if this is really what He wants us to do. And so I, I stayed there till the wee hours of the morning and just prayed through the city. And it was neat because when I when I look when I was standing at the at the building looking out over the city, I was like, man, these are these are our people. This is who we, we really need to reach these people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so that was important because you see all these people. And you saw these buildings that represented people. Really, that's what they are. They're buildings that represent people. There's the inhabitants thereof. That's what you're really concerned with, not with the structure that they're sitting in. But what was neat is that when I, when I took an opportunity to walk the city and I went over into the city and I looked back at the building, and I, I welcome you to do that, especially in the evening, it's just this amazing picture that, that, that I got. And it was, it was, the building looked like a shepherd on top of the hill just looking down over his flock. And that's who you are. I, I believe that's, what, that's who you are. You're the shepherd for this city. You're here to be the oasis, to be the protector, the provider. The, the, the ones that because you're here, Potiphar's house, Eustace, will be blessed because you're here for you to bring what God has given to you